Around the world, animals play all sorts of group games. Dolphins play catch with seaweed. Wrestling chimps make best friends for life. And hyenas play tug of war with their clan mates. Scientists are only beginning to uncover the secrets of these communal frolics. Their work is revealing the multitude of different ways animals play together. So why do animals need buddies to play with? And what are the rules of the game? In the mountains of New Zealand, a bizarre game is underway. Kia parrots are known by locals as the clowns of the mountains. They live a nomadic life, coming and going from group to group. And when they flock together, one of their favourite activities is pulling tourists' cars to pieces. They aren't looking for food or nesting materials. This act of destruction is one of the strange ways that Kia parrots play. And they're often seen doing it as a gang. So why are these nomadic birds so playful? Hi, Kiri. Hi, Kiri. To find out, biologist Raoul Schwing is conducting a series of experiments. A job that comes with its hazards. Stop it. Kia are extraordinarily playful. In fact, as far as we can tell, they're the most playful bird species on the planet. Whereas most animals play when they're juveniles, Kia play far into adulthood, both on their own, but also socially. Like most of us, animals only play when they're in the mood. Something that can be encouraged in Kias by giving them new objects or toys to play with. While Kias do sometimes play alone, Raoul's noticed how the playful mood of one can spread throughout the group. So he's setting up an experiment to test why their play appears to be contagious. Kias have excellent vision. They're attracted to vibrant colours, which stimulate a highly playful response in the group. That means using their beak to break things. But after some initial games, the novelty soon wears off. And the group's playful state comes to an end. Raoul thinks he's discovered a way to reignite their playfulness. He believes that Kias encourage each other to join in by using a particular play call. As you can hear, the Kia are highly vocal creatures. One of their calls is only associated with play behavior, the so-called play call. It sounds a little bit like this. Wow, 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 wow. Raoul thinks the sound of the play call alone has the power to change the mood of any Kia that hears it, causing them to instantly become more playful. He's recorded this call and is about to play it to this group for the very first time. For the moment, all is quiet and the birds no longer seem interested in the toys. 
Will simply hearing the call make them want to play again? The response is immediate. The group bursts back into life. Those that hear it play with whomever or whatever they come across. What we saw here, together with evidence from previous experiments in the wild, strongly suggests that those birds that hear the play call are put into a playful mood. It's something that Kias have in common with us. The effect is very similar to infectious laughter in human beings, where hearing someone laugh puts you in a better mood and makes things funnier. This recent discovery is the very first time such an effect has been found in a bird. The fact that Kias have evolved a specific call to incite play in the group suggests playing together must be important for something. It begs the question, why do they need partners to play with? Raoul thinks it may be the key to living in harmonious societies. We believe it's very important for them to have this play call and play effect as it spreads tolerance throughout the group and allows them to peacefully coexist. For Kias in the wild, encouraging others to join in with play is important when moving from flock to flock. It's a way to break the ice with new neighbours. Building tolerance is one benefit of playing with buddies. And scientists now think it can help animals in all sorts of ways. Social play really does have benefits, and that's one of the areas that scientists are really investigating and finding out some fascinating answers. It gives the player a whole set of skills, behaviours and knowledge that they will hopefully use uh, and utilise throughout the rest of their lives. In fact, as scientists study play in more detail, they're beginning to discover that playing group games can be far more challenging mentally than playing alone. One of the most playful animals on the planet helps to illustrate why. Atlantic spotted dolphins play all kinds of group games. But there's one in particular that the youngsters like to play more than any other. Chase. The leader breaks away and everyone else follows. This game might look simple. Scientists think it could offer benefits that these youngsters simply can't get from playing alone. In the Bahamas, marine biologist Kelly Malilo Sweeting is studying the play behavior of these young spotted dolphins. Research into dolphin play is ongoing. Uh, we don't have all of the answers yet. Play used to be thought of as a, a functionless activity, but now I think we're better understanding that social play is extremely beneficial. To find out why young spotted dolphins prefer playing together, Kelly wants to experience their games firsthand by joining in. For that, she'll need a little help. Her underwater scooter pulls her through the water almost three times faster than she can swim, which should make her a worthy playmate for a young dolphin. As Kelly circles the pod, her rapid movement soon catches the interest of a youngster. And the chase is on. Adults watch on, more and more youngsters join in with the game.
Movement-based play is a way for young animals to develop their bodies. As Kelly tries to keep up with their every twist and turn, it's clear how much more challenging play becomes when reacting to other dolphins. When dolphins are interacting with each other and they're having social play time, then we see a different complexity that can develop because they can't predict what the other dolphin is going to do. Young dolphins become good swimmers by playing alone. But the unpredictability of playing in a group pushes their speed and agility much further. It's the perfect way for young dolphins to practice their swimming skills. This play makes sense for juvenile dolphins. But what's intriguing is the group games aren't limited to the youngest members of the pod. One of the things we've asked is, do all dolphins play? Or is it something that only the youngsters do? And what I found interesting is that they all do it, from young members of the group, calves and juveniles, all the way up to adult males. While juveniles are content playing simple games like tag, adults prefer to play something more sophisticated not chase, but catch. All they need is a piece of seaweed. It's a game they can play alone, passing it from tooth to tail. But it's much more fun with buddies. So why would fully grown adults that have completed their physical development waste time playing catch? Kelly thinks they're getting more than just physical training out of these group games. One of the great benefits of social play is undoubtedly social bonding. In addition to all of the things that they're gaining in terms of exercise and agility and mobility, uh, they're creating bonds with another individual or multiple individuals. And we believe that these play interactions create those bonds. These bonds created through play are the glue that helps hold the pod together. It's crucial for dolphins when it comes to hunting. Because by working together in tight pods, they can catch more fish than they can alone. A typical Atlantic spotted dolphin pod has around 15 individuals. But for animals with larger groups, things can sometimes get a little unruly and politics start to become a problem. In these complex societies, playing together can make or break an animal's success. <laughs> Chimpanzees live in groups up to 150 strong. In such great numbers, it's inevitable that tempers sometimes flare. With so much to learn about their social world, it takes chimps about 10 years to grow up. It's one of the longest childhoods in the animal kingdom. That means lots of time to play. don't know it, but 
they're getting hidden benefits from playing together. Young chimps that join in with more group games reach developmental milestones at an earlier age, such as walking and forming close personal bonds with other members of the troop. Primatologist Edwin van Leeuwen has been studying chimps for 11 years. He knows just how important forming bonds can be. It's very important for chimpanzees to form strong social bonds because during their lifetime they have to rely on each other. For example, to find food resources and uh, to defend each other in fights and to, uh, to also defend the group against neighboring groups. In the wild, a chimp's first experience of play can come in the form of being tickled by adults. These little guys are orphans, so Edvin's lending a hand. There's something about tickling that makes it hard to resist. That's because it releases a chemical in the brain that gives a feeling of pleasure. There's a release of oxytocin, just like in humans, and, uh, and that keeps them uh, wanting to play uh, again and again. Oxytocin is otherwise known as the love hormone. It's released during many forms of group games. And as well as making play simply feel good, scientists think this hormone helps form and strengthen social bonds. Play and the fun that they derive from it is actually helping them to create these bonds and to be more successful in later life. By age four, juveniles are already widening their social circle, working out whom they get along with within the wider troop. It becomes very important whom they form these bonds with, as they may become friends for life. In chimpanzees, you see consistently that individuals have preferences with whom they play, with whom they hang out. We call them bond partners. They want to spend more time with each other and they enjoy each other's company. Quite simply, bond partners are friends. <laughs> In this captive troop, a friendship is starting to bloom. A male and a young female. <laughs> These two best friends spend more time playing together than with anyone else. Through all this play, not only are they forming a strong bond, they're also working out whether they can trust one another. Because there are many times in a chimp's life when it will need to work together with other members of the group. It's very important for chimpanzees to choose their allies carefully because they know um, that once they are invested in a particular partner, they want to rely on them. So the partner needs to be trustworthy. Chimps that have developed a strong bond are much more likely to cooperate when they need to. Or at least, that's the theory. To put it to the test, Edwin's setting this playful pair a challenge. He wants to find out if they've now played enough together to trust each other. In clear view of the chimps, he's placing an irresistible treat onto either side of a floating raft, which will be pulled to the other side of a deep water lake. A length of rope is connected to the raft, but the rope isn't tied. It's simply looped through. Pulling only one end will result in just a handful of rope. To get the nutritious snack, two chimps will need to cooperate by pulling both ends together. 
But will the chimps be trusting enough to work as a team? The little female is the first to show an interest. She can see that she needs to pull on the rope somehow. But alone, she comes up empty-handed. Her efforts haven't gone unnoticed by her friend. Using their trusting relationship built by play, together they attempt to puzzle it out. Through trial, and error. But it doesn't take long for them to find the solution. And they each get a share of the prize. It's incredible to see such sophisticated problem solving here, like cooperative problem solving. They actually worked it out together. These youngsters will remember this cooperative success. By working together and by sharing the reward, they've strengthened their friendship, making them more likely to cooperate again in the future. This all-important friendship is largely thanks to time spent playing together. For chimps in the wild, having friends they can trust is crucial. When conflict breaks out in the group, they need to be sure someone's there to back them up. Making friends is one thing, but keeping them is something else entirely. So how do animals maintain these close social bonds? One group of predators has found the answer. Grey wolves. These pack animals can live and hunt in groups of up to 20 strong. It's vital that wolves don't fall out with their pack mates. Because with the most powerful bite force of any canine, fighting could prove fatal. Top predators play together in a boisterous way that has the potential to be mistaken for aggression. But wolves have evolved an ingenious solution to ensure their playful antics don't get confused with confrontation. Scientists first observed it by studying an animal much closer to home. Dogs were domesticated from wolves more than 15,000 years ago. But they've retained many of their wild behaviours. Leading play scientist Professor Mark Beckhoff has spent nearly 50 years studying the behaviour of both dogs and their wild cousins. By studying dogs, you can learn a lot 
about their wild relatives. What surprises people is how few differences there are in the basic behavior of domestic dogs when you compare them to wild wolves or to wild coyotes. Just like wolves, for dogs, playing with buddies is a vigorous activity. They chase, shove, and bite one another. This close combat can look very much like real aggression. So how do they tell each other that they just want to play? Dogs have evolved a set of signals to basically reduce the likelihood, almost to zero, that play fighting will escalate into real aggression. By watching dogs play in slow motion, Mark has deciphered the code of their body language. This crouched posture, with head to the ground and hind end in the air, is known as the play bow. Play bow, a very specific signal that's used to say, I want to play with you, I don't want to fight with you, or mate with you, or eat you, or dominate you. And it doesn't look like much, but it's actually a very specific signal that's used during play. When two dogs play, they become so in tune with each other, they often synchronize their play bows. The delay can be as little as three hundredths of a second. This way of communicating that they want to play is something that all dog owners can see in their pets. But it's also evident among nearly all members of the canine family. Wolves do it. African wild dogs do it. And even coyotes. But telling their playmates they mean them no harm is just the first step. Once play gets underway, it's important these predators don't break the rules of the game. Mark believes there is a set of rules governing play that almost all canines adhere to. And we can see them in action with help from a willing participant. Meet Zeppelin, an eight-month-old pooch fitted with the latest action cam technology, which will give a dog's eye view of this canine code of conduct. There are four basic rules of play that dogs generally understand. The first one being, ask first. Barking first gains the attention of a potential play partner. And only when they're looking does the play bow take place. Oh, there's a play bow. With the formalities out of the way, play can commence. When dogs have signed up to play, it's important not to be too rough. This is rule number two. Rule number two, mind your manners. Don't bite too hard. Don't slam into another dog too hard. Dogs use self-restraint to ensure they don't inflict injuries on their playmates. It's particularly important for their wild and more dangerous cousins. As the rough and tumble starts to heat up, Zeppelin's partner takes things too far. She breaks rule number two. And play comes to a grinding halt. 
Rule number three, admit when you're wrong. If you bite too hard, back off, do a play bow, and hope that the other dog says, okay, I trust you, let's play. She's doing a play bow. This is great. Once acknowledged, play can resume. The final rule is perhaps the most important. Rule number four, be honest. Don't ask another dog to play and then violate the rules. It's important to play fairly because if an individual is labeled to be a cheater in play, they could be ostracized from play groups. For wild canines, that could prove fatal. A study on wild coyotes found that individuals who violate the rules of play are shunned by the pack and are four times less likely to survive. Whether coyote, wild dog or wolf, being part of a pack is crucial for hunting large prey. So pack members stay on good terms by all playing the same game with the same set of rules. As scientists dig deeper to understand the benefits of play, they've discovered that sometimes how an animal plays and what games it chooses to play can depend on its role within the group. This is particularly evident in some troops of primates. Chakma baboons. These monkeys live in social groups of up to 200 individuals. Playtime is a noisy affair. Wildlife coordinator Camilla Forsell has helped raise this troop of orphan baboons for the last five years. She's noticed that different troop members play differently and wants to know why. Some of the baboons are definitely more playful than other ones in this troop. Some are very, very goofy and they'll constantly try to encourage play, where some of them can be a bit rougher. These differences become more apparent as the baboons reach about six months old. Scientists think this variation is linked to their sex. One of the interesting questions that's come up over the years is the differences between how male animals and female animals play. Often the play is very similar, particularly when they're very young, but there's often then a divergence in the amount of play and the aggressiveness of the play. For baboons, these differences are just as you might expect. Males, their play is usually more about dominancy. They play very, very rough, where they pull on each other, bite on each other, and there's sometimes a lot of drama going on in that play too. Young male baboons prefer to play with other males, and their favourite game is play fighting. When they reach adulthood, males have to find a new troop to join and battle their way up the social hierarchy. So by play fighting when they're young, they can practice their fighting skills. But it's a very different story for the female members of the troop. Young females like to play with one particular age group above all others. Babies. Mm -hmm. 
What you can see with the boon females is that they often very early on start being interested in babies. Already when they're older juveniles, they'll start going towards the little ones and they'll want to babysit them, play with them. And you can almost see it as they are actually practicing for the day they get their own baby. Playing mother begins at just six months old. Even though females won't reach maturity until they're five. Scientists have found that the more females play with babies when they're young, the more successful mothers they become in later life. Sex differences in play are observed in human children too. And as adults, we often buy boys and girls very different kinds of toys. But it's an age-old question whether their own preferences are due to social influences or intrinsic biological differences. Very often, toy preferences in human children are quite clearly distinct from one another. Little girls like dolls and little boys like cars or rockets, for example. What we don't know is how far that goes back. Is it nature or is it nurture? Unlike us, our primate cousins don't have to comply with sex stereotypes. So studying whether male and female monkeys show the same toy preferences as us could reveal some interesting truths about ourselves. It's an experiment that's never been tried with this troop before. Camilla's putting them to the test by laying out some sex stereotype toys. For the males, trucks and planes. Active toys with moving parts. For the females, furry, doll-like toys. But will these young baboons really show a preference for different toys based on their sex? The first to take a look is a bold young male. After some initial investigation, his attention quickly turns to a shiny yellow plane. He's not the only male to choose one of the active toys. The males were very interested in the wheels and how they were moving, and also all of the shiny parts of the car seemed to be very interesting. The females soon get involved and show a clear preference for the dolls. The females were carrying the dolls, almost like they would be carrying their own babies. It's hard to say if this was for protection, so they could actually protect them from the other baboons, or if it was maternal instincts. It may not be a perfect science experiment, but this mirrors what's been found in various primate species. The games primates choose to play is partly determined by whether they're male or female. And this suggests that to some extent, sex affects how humans play too. For baboons, males and females have evolved to play in the particular way that's most beneficial to them in later life. For female baboons, it's about becoming better mothers. While for males, it may just give them the edge when fighting their way up the ranks of society. But some animals inherit their rank at birth, and it can be fixed for life. Do they find any advantage in playing together? 
one predator that demonstrates the importance of social play is also governed by one of the strictest hierarchies on Earth. The spotted hyena. Hyena clans can number up to 100 strong. Every clan member is assigned a rank that will almost never change for as long as it's part of the group. Social status can make the difference between feast and famine. But scientists are discovering that playing together could offer a lifeline for hyenas at the bottom of the pecking order. Hyena biologist Kate Steinfield is part of a research team that's been studying hyenas in Kenya for the last 30 years. There are many misconceptions about spotted hyena society. Historically, they've been painted as thieves and scavengers and villains. But in all actuality, they're incredibly successful hunters. They're very invested mothers, and they live in these socially complex, intelligent societies. To find out why playing together is so important for low-ranked hyenas, Kate needs to track down a den site to find some youngsters. After each mother has their cub, they keep them at a natal den for about one month. But after that month is up, all of the moms within a territory will move their hyena cubs to a communal den. This is where all of the cubs will meet all of the other hyenas in their clan that are the same age. Every cub inherits its rank from its mother. But as the youngsters meet their new clanmates, they have to work out for themselves where they fit into the hierarchy. The lowest ranked cubs learn the hard way. This young male is at the bottom of the pecking order. He's the target of relentless bullying, which reinforces his low status. We do see a lot of aggressions from clanmate to clanmate, but these aggressions are generally ritualized aggressions or very stereotyped. They're never very severe. While the aim of this aggression isn't to cause injury, cubs of low rank suffer high levels of stress. There have been some really interesting studies that actually show that animals do physically show signs of stress, often from psychological uh, causes. So the more stressful a group situation is, for example, the more physically stressed an animal can become. Stress weakens the immune system over time and can even shorten an animal's lifespan. For a low-ranked hyena, life may seem hopeless. But everything changes when Kate introduces a toy to the clan. These cubs are really inquisitive with new things that they find in their environment. Here we have a little rope toy and we're hoping that we can encourage some play behavior. The dominant cubs are quick to get involved. And they start a game of tug of war. The low ranked male watches on as the others have all the fun. dares to try his luck at getting in on the game. <laughs> what happens next is astonishing. Not only is he permitted to join in, the 
others allow him a taste of what it's like to be dominant by letting him take control of the rope. Play is actually one of the only times in Spotted Hyena society where this really strict hierarchy completely breaks down and it becomes socially acceptable for high rankers and low rankers to play with each other and vice versa. This extraordinary breakdown in the hierarchy isn't just between cubs. Even adults join in with group games. They too allow low-ranked youngsters a moment of victory. But why? What's to be gained by this role reversal? One of the theories that we currently have for the function of play behavior is that it actually reduces stress in hyenas. So it's thought that when cubs are playing with adults, that perhaps it's actually lowering the stress of the hyenas. Kate and her team are measuring the level of stress hormones in these young hyenas before and after playtime. Research is still ongoing, but early results show that stress levels do seem to be lower following group play. It's something that scientists are beginning to find in species throughout the animal kingdom. One thing we are finding is that play and stress are intimately related, and play may be a way of relieving or dealing with stress. It's clear how this stress relief could be hugely beneficial for low-ranked hyenas. But what's in it for the more dominant members of the clan? We often see that in groups that play more, there's often less stress within the group as a whole. By having positive interactions with those of lower rank, all the hyenas in the clan are able to bond together, regardless of where they sit in the hierarchy. The power of the clan is incredibly important. One of the reasons for creating these really amazing social bonds between clanmates is so that spotted hyenas can have strength in numbers when it really counts. Out on the plains, every hyena's greatest rival is the lion. One on one, hyenas don't stand a chance against these far bigger predators, which often steal their kills. But hyenas can overcome their common enemy together by standing shoulder to shoulder as one. This uniting of the clan could be possible because of all the important bonds formed through playing together. For hyenas, whatever their rank, the benefits they get from playtime can be a matter of life and death. <laughs> Scientists now agree that throughout the animal kingdom, playing with buddies can be hugely beneficial. Animals that are social learn through play how to be social, how to be with others. So long as everyone follows the rules of the game, playing together can boost tolerance in groups to help everyone get along. Build trusting friendships needed to thrive in complex societies. And bind groups together to achieve far more than they ever could alone. For all these social animals, playing together is crucial for their success and perhaps even their survival. Oh, <laughs> my